This morning's reading is Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> so good to be back. So, back, uh, so it was about 26 years ago, it was 26 years ago, when I first attended St Mary's, um, having given Andy my story and what a mess my life was in at that time. And Andy said, you'd probably be better off just maybe attending the Alpha course. So I did that, not knowing what that meant, not knowing that you get a free meal with it every time as well. And so I sat over on that, in uh, that side of the church there, did the Alpha course and gave my life uh, to the Lord at that time. What an incredible time uh, of life that was for me. And I then met Sarah. She was never going to date uh, a non-Christian, so she had her eye on me, hoping I'd got a a pass mark on the Alpha course, as it were. And, uh, and so the rest is history uh, with, well, not so much with her yet. She's still around. Um, she's, <laughs> she's... Uh, is this, this has been recorded, oh dear. And uh, so she's at, uh, ordained at the same time as me some seven years ago and runs a church up in uh, Chandler's Ford and will be joining me for lunch down here in a bit. Um, so we got married 25 years ago in Jersey and then had a celebration uh, here some a um, uh, few weeks afterwards and I got new shoes for it and I've got the same new shoes on today so they're, they're lasting as long as, uh, as long as Sarah and I are so that's going well. But what a blessing this place is and as soon as uh, I was able or as soon as Andy could convince me I got involved with the youth group here and stayed uh, Sarah and I stayed having a heart for the youth when we then moved to Jersey soon after uh, 23 years ago we moved to Jersey because Sarah's from Jersey originally and we got involved in running the youth group and eventually the youth group ran us and uh, we needed to uh, find more time for what we're being called to uh, before the Lord. And who knew that sat there 25 years ago that I'd end up with one of these and what an incredible journey it's been for me. Thank you for this place, for Andy and Fee. It's never just Andy, it's always Andy and Fee, isn't it? And um, so it must have been eight and a half years ago, we sat in Andy and Fee's garden and Andy said something like, so how's your call for ordination going? I hadn't got a clue what that meant, but I do know that it made me cry, and um, so pursued that, and uh, indeed, I was going to say Andy was right, but I think it's God that was right uh, through Andy at that time, and so it does feel sl slightly surreal standing here being called the Reverend Cliff <laughs> in front of you. Um, 
but we're here for remembrance, aren't we, on a little more of a, a somber note, really. And there are times throughout the year where we remember uh, loved ones that have died, um, at their anniversary of their death and so on. And not that we glorify them, but we remember the love that we have for them. We do the same today, don't we? But we don't glorify war. War is never, ever a good thing. We're called to be peacemakers, reconcilers, not fighters. And in those two minutes where we stop and remember, we honour them and we give thanks for their sacrifice. I managed to iron all of my stuff. I've had a haircut, especially my shoes are nice and shiny, my medal's in the right place. I checked it out on Google Images, how you're meant to wear it with your poppy to get it right and so on. And this place is looking pristine. And so there are no distractions. Everything's prepared. There are no distractions. You can't look for the scuff on my shoe because there isn't one. And so we're here to, to be clear, to be uh, looking at what God has to say to us this morning. During preparation, during Andy mentioned that I was in the, uh, the Staffordshire Regiment and then transferred to be a physical training instructor in the Army. It's a year-long course at Aldershot, uh, some of which is pain, no, most of which is pain, some of which is fun, fun and enjoyable. And I had to organise uh, a tug-of-war comp competition and was assessed on it. It seemed to go well. The assessor seemed to think I did a good job, but the table that had the sheet on it that had all the trophies. I'd laid the sheet out and he said, so the sheet's looking nice, but you, why wasn't it ironed? Now I'd been up until two o'clock the night before because I was on duty. I'd had exams and other lessons to prepare for and so on. I said that I didn't have time. And he said, well, did you sleep last night? Well, of course I slept last night. The inference is, of course, that I chose to sleep instead of iron the sheet. Well, I thought that was reasonable. He didn't. And uh, so it's all about that preparation thing. And when I talk to Sarah and, uh, and she says she doesn't have time, I don't ask her if she slept last night. That might get me in trouble. <laughs> but we need to prepare well, don't we, uh, for things like if you're painting a wall, then you make sure that the plaster is nice and smooth and prepared well or we make sure that there's enough petrol in the tank to get us on that long journey. And I, like a lot of um, people in the services that we remember here today, know that during my basic training as an infantryman, and before my tour of Northern Ireland, before my time in Belize, uh, in the jungle there, um, that teaching and practice of immediate action drills uh, in so many different situations, sometimes under pressure with the stopwatch on, sometimes in the dark, sometimes uh, getting up in the middle of, of the night to make sure you've got the hang of it. Practice, 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 and checking and checking. Well, it all ended up worth it. There were no shortcuts, and I wonder if there are people here that can relate to some of that. Christians the world over also prepare for life, for difficult situa situations, for helping the lost and the lonely in many circumstances by growing in their relationship with God, encasing their life with prayer to Jesus, our Saviour, our Creator God. We pray to the God who came to save us in the man Jesus, God's only Son. And it says in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The importance of prayer, the ongoing lines of communication are crucial. They're central to our relationship with our God of hope. We talk about starting a new job sometimes, don't we? Where um, if you're advertising, you want someone that's going to be ready for the job, the right person that's going to hit the ground running so you've not got any wasting too much time in inducting them. They can get on with the job straight away. And um, that's a good idea, isn't it? So you can save time. Um, as Christians, however, we're encouraged to hit the ground kneeling 
as the title of this book by Stephen Cottrell uh, refers to. It's called Hit the Ground Kneeling. Stephen Cottrell's now the uh, Archbishop of York, and he talks about um, leadership um, principles and so on, and put, looks at them through a, a Christian lens. Hit the ground kneeling, prayer first. Another book with a similar sentiment is called Too Busy Not to Pray. So we've got a lot going on in our lives and we haven't got time for all of that stuff and we put prayer to the back, uh, on the back burner and we'll catch up with it later. Well, the book infers that and suggests that we put prayer in front of all of that and indeed the busier we are, the more prayer we need to consider and to be prayerful in all that we do. And we're to develop a prayerful, considered approach to all of our life. In all of that, it might help that we had perhaps a bit more of God's perspective on it all. In the book, Two Kings in the Bible, where um, a man by the name of Elisha is surrounded by physical enemies and is feeling under pressure that he's likely to die at this point turns to God in prayer, and God gives him a vision for what that answer to prayer looks like. And the hillside around him are covered with armies of God, outnumbering the physical enemy. Life at times like that can be quite immediate and physical, and yet, in part, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, do we? but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, as it says in Ephesians 6. This is where we often find ourselves. It's certainly where Eli Elisha found himself at that point, outnumbered. And yet, in prayer, God showed his power in that situation. Now, I know life isn't that straightforward. You know, we pray well and we prepare well and all will be okay. Well, these wrinkles and this bald head and the grey hair don't come at, uh, at no cost. I've had certainly lots of ups and downs to know that it's not as straightforward as that. Today, essentially, we remember what is the result of a broken, messed up world, don't we? Prayer is not that um, magic wand that we wave when we like to get us out of a sticky situation, but it's a communication and it's central to our relationship with God. Like I would as a soldier, I would carry my personal weapon around with me everywhere in readiness. And so I pray continually now in every situation, having an ear to God for what he might be calling me to be or to say in any situation, keeping those lines of communication open, keeping them real and keeping them honest before God. And so Psalm 91 that we heard read, it's known as the soldier's prayer, as, the one, uh, as one of the best examples um, before to that we plead before God for protection and a reminder of his never-failing love. Along with Psalm 23, it's one of the most popular psalms used by many emergency and armed services. It's one of the most written about um, on the internet, for example. And we know, don't we, that um, the military works really hard on protection. It has a thing going back, that's been put in place during the Cold War, and it's called Mutually Assured Destruction. So we have the Russians, for example, fire a missile to the UK, and it's going to um, blow places up in the UK, but we have time, knowing that that's on its way, to send one to them to get them back before they've got us, and so we're mutually assured of destruction. Chilling, isn't it, that that could actually be in place, but it's effective. And I think there's something, the fact that it spells um, mutually assured 
destruction spells mad. I don't think that's a mistake. It says in Wikipedia um, that uh, discompassionately, it says that the payoff of the mad doctrine was and still is expected to be a tense but stable global peace. And it goes on to say that many have argued that mutually assured destruction is unable to de de deter conventional war that could later escalate. Well, we certainly know that if you're anywhere near the news at the moment. A mess that we're in. The military have more protection. They've got tanks that would take a hit from almost anything. And they have guys with more armor on than they could barely carry going forward to defuse um, bombs on the front line, line a def, dis, uh, an explosive device. But all of this protection is only secure against things physical. This prayer takes protection, protection beyond that and this life. Some of those whom we remember today that identified that this was the soldier's prayer, they're the ones that maybe who identified that any amount of physical protection just falls short of any of God's promises, his promises in the Bible. The psalm says early on, excuse me, the psalm says early on, those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. It says a little bit further on, for he will rescue you from every trap and protect you. Then he will shield you with his wings. He will shelter you under his wings. His faithful promises are your armour and protection. There's a number of terms there that are the promises that God gives us for his security. To dwell or to live in that secret place with him, in his shadow, in his protection, the refuge and his fortress. Sounds to me like that's a great prayer in times of battle where we're able to hang on to these truths. Amazing strength and comfort can be taken from all of this. Like I say, he doesn't promise us a world free from danger, but he does promise his presence whenever we face danger. God wants the best for us. He calls us on in our hope-filled journey with him, a relationship with each one of us as we shelter in him and he protects us. It's a prayer when we can call on these truths in times of extreme danger. It isn't a lifesaver where bullets are going to bounce off because we prayed or because we're Christian or something. Stuff still goes wrong. Disasters, people dying far too young cannot be just shrugged off because we prayed. But a reassurance that God is on the case and in this broken, mixed up, warring world, he has us under his wings of protection. That's to say for this world and beyond with him. He becomes our rock to cling to in the storms of life, the comfort in times of loss, a direction and compass bearing when the rudder of life breaks. A good message for us all today, perhaps, as we encounter stresses and fears of all kinds to know these promises. It says in this passage, he is the almighty, most high, my God in whom I trust. I wonder if there's anyone that has a situation perhaps in their lives or in our lives today where we might need to hear those words of huge encouragement, of huge comfort and support. Sometimes it might not be a gun or a bullet or a bomb type war in the middle of pool or a missile, missile from afar, but the battle to stand up for what we know to be true, to be right and proper before God. So we push back against the subtle pressures to do wrong in our confused, conflicting society. 
that doing wrong will look different for each one of us, perhaps. We're each tempted in many different, often damaging ways. So let me, in the name of Jesus, encourage us to push back against that, whatever that might be for you. This psalm might be a midweek prayer as well as one that we hear on Sunday. Might I encourage you to stick a copy of it on your fridge to refer to later. It feels like this psalm is a great one, isn't it, for serving men and women to lean on to recite and pray continually. Then it ends with the comforting words from verse 14 onwards. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honour them. I will satisfy them with a long, and give, a long life and give them my salvation. The first part of that, verse 14, is so precious that the monastic prayer of Compline prayed every evening, quotes it, as they settle down for the night. The message version of that last section says this, I'll give you the best of care if you'll only get to know and trust me. Call me and I'll answer. Be at your side in bad times. I'll rescue you, then throw you a party. I'll give you a long life. I'll give you a long drink of salvation. What a way to end that wonderful psalm, that wonderful prayer. No doubt that we can trust in him that he's for us. Or as, he, as they put it in John 15, remain in me and I will remain in you. The God who made the universe, the God who made every detail of life as we know it, cares for you, cares for each one of us. He loves you. He loves us. And so every time, every, uh, however tough times may get, however fearful we can trade this for trust in him. He is for us, protecting us, his angels watching over us. And this goes alongside that last point where it talks about being satisfied with a long life or with a long drink of salvation. I love that translation. An eternal life with God. Christian service personnel the world over continue to fight for what seems to be right, obeying the will of the politicians, whether the cause appears to be just or not. For some, it seems to be right to be there to serve the Lord as they pray this psalm, this psalm to help them go from fear to security. As I close, just one short um, a uh, story, if you like, from um, what is becoming the front line of the prison for me. Um, we have a number of volunteers that work with us in there, one of which is Andrew, who is a, a retired lieutenant colonel in the Royal Artillery, don't you know? And um, he's such a, a good bloke. And I just, every Thursday he comes in and I go home six inches taller because of the um, encouragement that he brings to that place. And this is... He turned 80 a couple of weeks ago, and this is um, the best day of his week to come into prison on the Thursday. And he said, why didn't I know about this ministry beforehand? And he gets the guys from the wing, brings them to the chapel, gives them a good listening to, talks to them about Jesus if it's appropriate, prays with them if it's appropriate, and then sends them back to the wing and does the same again. And he just loves it, they love it. And we're changing individual lives uh, in the name of Jesus in that place. It's really encouraging. One guy, um, a guy by the name of Jay, um, a retired infantryman, um, more tattoos than he had skin for, it felt like, certainly more muscles than he had skin for, and, um, and he was struggling with being diagnosed with uh, mental health issues and PTSD for his time in the service, and he comes to prison and he's properly fearful for what is about to happen. And he's 
doesn't know how to be, it doesn't know to, what to do with the chorus of the crash bang of the wings disturbing him and shaking him every time someone slams a door. And he's properly fearful for what next. Someone just happened to him, encourage him to attend the Alpha course. So he comes along to one of the groups and finds it too difficult. He can't sit with the group and, and pay attention. So another volunteer, uh, Emily, spends a time with him each week going through the Alpha course one-to-one. -one. Beautiful when he gives his life to the Lord in there. Beautiful that he now knows that he's got to take his medication. He knows he's got to accept help and he knows that he's loved and cherished by the risen Jesus. We prayed uh, the week before last, that last week when he went to court, that the truth would be known. And if the truth comes out, according to what he told me anyway, that he should be released. And so we're praying for the truth as when, any, when anyone says, can you pray for me because I'm going to court? I won't pray for them to be released. I think justice needs to be done, right? But I will pray for the truth to be known. The truth was known uh, for him last week. He walked, he walked out of prison, walked from court to a church that will love him like you lot loved me when I first came here. He was able to go in the name of Jesus from fear to security. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are indeed thankful for and remember those that gave there today so that we can have our tomorrow. We're thankful for those that serve today so that we may live in relative safety. Thank you for our service personnel doing such a heroic thing for king and country. Comfort those in times of loss, stress, danger, and trouble. Thank you, Lord, for your promises. Thank you for your protection. Help us now to walk in this knowledge. Thank you, Lord. What an amazing God you are. Amen.